Welcome to the Career uh, Conversations panel, Alumni Perspectives on Further Education Options for Liberal Arts Students. Um, my name is Sandy Yu, and I'm the employer of an alumni liaison for the um, University Career Center. And I will be um, the moderator for this afternoon's discussion. Um, the Career Center is the co host and co organizer uh, for this event. Um, we collaborated with um, the Center for Student Success in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. Um, and uh, we also want to thank, um, so we want to thank them, and we want to thank um, the Alumni Relations Office for sponsoring uh, the Career Conversation Series. Um, so the purpose of this session is to connect you, student, with um, professionals who, um, and uh, your alumni, who pr uh, pursued further education beyond their undergraduate studies in a variety of um, areas that are um, commonly popular among liberal arts students. Um, so, so that you can actually learn from their educational um, experiences and gain some insight into what those programs are like and whether they would be a good fit for you, um, and, and possibly learn a little bit about the um, career opportunities that exist for um, people who graduate from those programs. Okay, and there will also be a, an opportunity later on in the afternoon to do a bit of networking. So that's one. That's the third purpose of the, um, today's session. Okay. Um, so before I begin, or we begin the panel, I'd like to ask um, all of you to turn off your cell phones and mobile devices so that we could be free of disruptions. Um, and if you haven't already done so, please make sure you sign in um, at the registration table. So if you registered, your name should be on the list. And if, it's, if you don't see it there or you didn't register, then just feel free to add it um, on one of the blank pages. Okay? Um, and. Um, I do want to mention we've got some booklets for um, the Career Center services and programs. So if you haven't been by the Career Center, you didn't know that the Career Center existed on campus, um, we offer free and great services to all current students and recent graduates within two years of graduation. So regardless of what uh, kind of what career or job, job search question you've got, we can help we can provide some support. So whether it be you just need a job or you're wondering um, you know, what do I do with my degree, or I'm thinking about post-grad or graduate studies, um, but I'm not quite sure which program would be a good fit for me, um, or I, I just need help get, um, putting together my resume, or maybe you've decided that you are going to be pursuing one of the programs featured here, and you need some help with your application. Um, we can provide all kinds of support in, in those regards, okay? Um, so, just a um, we'll have about an hour for discussion, and then at approximately 4.45, we will begin our informal networking uh, mix and mingle session. So that at that time, you'll have an opportunity to um, speak to um, our panelists face-to-face -face and um, ask some of your um, some questions that you uh, may not be comfortable asking in a larger group format. And there will be an opportunity for you also. Um, so I'll get the discussion started with a few questions, and then there will be an opportunity later on for you to ask um, our panelists some questions. Okay, so um, I'm going to get started with um, the first question. Um, oh, before I do that, uh, let me introduce you to our distinguished guests. We wouldn't be here without uh, today without them. So um, let me introduce you to um, on our, my immediate left is Omar Ali Khan. Um, Omar is Central Agency Liaison Coordinator um, with the Cabinet Office um, with the Government of Ontario, and. Um, Omar did um, his graduate studies in public administration. That's right. right. Okay. Um, next to that, uh, Omar is Benjamin Bryce, um, who is um, a doctoral candidate with the Department of History here at York University. Okay. And I overheard you say you just finished your. Well, I'm just finishing. Just finishing. In January. Okay. Congratulations. Um, next to Benjamin is Joseph Romano, um, teacher and POR. Um, and Joseph can tell you more about that later um, um, with the Toronto District School Board. Okay. And um, Joseph um, did his, um, he's a triple uh, Triple, alumnus, yeah, right? triple. Um, so he did his Bachelor of Fine Arts here um, at York, Bachelor of Education here yeah. at York, and Master of Education at York as well. Yeah, too long. <laughs> <laughs> and then Diane Baker Mason, um, thank you for coming, um, is um, an author and lawyer um, with Mitchell Barden and Zaluki. Mm -hmm. um, 
and um, an alumna who did her um, undergraduate studies in English literature here. And my um, law degree at Oz. Oh, okay, law so. degree at Oz, great. great. Um, okay, so my first question for the panelists is um, if you could just tell us a little bit more about yourself, um, the role that you uh, play, um, or what you do on a day to day basis, and um, uh, yeah, basically a little bit more about you and the work that you do. Uh, Omar? Okay, great. So just to start, as, um, as Susan said, I basically work for the Ontario Public Service, so I'm a civil servant. And, uh, you know, I often go out and make presentations to other folks in the government because we are part of Cabinet Office, so we support the Premier and his staff. And oftentimes the first question is, what do you do? And the best way that I can kind of describe what I do is, is that I'm somewhat like a mole. And how, I'll explain that to you folks. Is the fact is, is that when you have government initiatives, they actually, you know, it's a policy. There's a policy piece of it, and there's also the fiscal piece. And both of them have to come together in order for them to be sustainable. So where my role comes into it is, is that I go to all the meetings where all these financial decisions are made. And I listen to what the discussion is there. And I go back. And I share that with our folks in the policy area. So it's very neat that way because you actually really get that different kind of perspective. So that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I just make sure is that the fiscal piece of it comes in line with the policy piece of it. And I can go further into more of a discussion as to what my role beyond that is as well. But I thought I'd just start with that. Um, yeah, so I'm still <coughs> in the graduate history program at York. Um, so perhaps... Uh, outlining not what I do today, but what I've done in the past five years, very briefly, uh, would be most helpful. So like a PhD in history or in any program at York starts with usually one year of coursework, uh, or eight months of coursework, and then eight months preparing for an exam, a very large exam that uh, after you pass, then you start your dissertation. Um, and then I spent about a year and a half in archives. It was just full-time work, like nine to five, uh, five days a week in archives in uh, Canada, Argentina, and Germany. In my case, you would pick your own uh, countries to study. Uh, and then in the past year and a half, um, I've, I just wrote a dissertation based on that archival uh, uh, research. Um, at the same time, usually you TA um, one course, you lead like a two-hour two tutorial week and then all the preparation that goes around it. Um, and then finally, in the very final stage of your dissertation, um, you don't write your dissertation. All you do is apply for jobs all over North America. Uh, so currently what I do is just apply for jobs in places like Georgia. Um, so, but I don't think that really encapsulates uh, a PhD program at York. So that's it. Thank you. Joseph? OK, so um, like it was said, this I've been here since 2008. I did a fine arts degree. And concurrently, I did my um, Bachelor of Education. And then I just, I think it was last Wednesday or Tuesday, graduated with my MED. And um, from that time, I was lucky enough to get a job as a teacher from 2008 up until this point. And within those four years, um, I've done a lot of I, what I like to think of as progressive work. And it's kind of worked in tandem with what I did through my master's study. Um, I'm a teacher, but as well, I, I hold a position of responsibility within our school, which means I'm on a track for a principalship. And it's sort of a, a stepping stone role. I like to call it um, sort of a watered down VP position. And basically, I have a portfolio of different um, initiatives that are ministry mandated, school board mandated, that um, I'm in charge of. And then the principal has their own portfolio as well. And um, I'm sort of the liaison between the teaching staff, the administration, and um, the board. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a jack of all trades type position. And once in a while, I get to, uh, like yesterday, sit with a group of uh, kindergarten kids and um, have them tug on my shirt and that type of thing. So it's a, it's a varied role. It goes from something that can be um, really intense, um, as in the board just spent about $10 million to purchase um, laptops that are being rolled out at every school. And our school, we're lucky enough with the proposal to put in for two sets of these laptops. We've got about 100 laptops coming in next week, and I'm in charge of those. And I've got to initiate the program and how they're going to be used to um, meet the ministry requirements. So that's, you know, one piece of the puzzle. But then, you know, I could be doing something like helping somebody uh, fix a printer or set up network uh, connection in their room. So it's kind of a, sort of a mesh between many different things. 
Well, I'm a lawyer, principally at this point, um, which wasn't exactly what I planned on doing full time, um, to the exclusion of much of my artistic side. I mean, my, the place card says Diane Baker Mason, which is my writing name, um, because there were other Diane Masons when I uh, started getting some success uh, with my novels, etc., out there writing. So we threw in my maiden name as well, so I wouldn't be confused with um, all the other Diane Masons out there who are also successful writers. Um, economics drove me into law, although I did always have a huge interest in justice, etc. Um, whether law and justice actually operate together, justice tends to be extremely subjective. You can win a dispute and still feel that you have been cheated. There's very little that lawyers can do about that. Um, there's also a huge variety within law and opportunities for choice and how you want to practice and where you want to practice and who you want to hang around with, um, whether you want to be a sole practitioner uh, or somebody on Bay Street. There's also all sorts of areas of, uh, of government law and editing, etc. But in terms of the nexus between writing and, and the law or the, you know, my artistic endeavors, I was cautioned when I went into law, which was I was a mature student. I didn't actually even graduate from high school um, because of family circumstances. I left home quite young. I ended up coming to Atkinson as a mature student when I was about 23 or 24, and over the years did manage to end up here full time, acquired my degree, thought I was going to be a writer full time. <laughs> There's, like I said, economics drives you, and uh, I ended up in law school as well. And I had hoped I would be able to do two. Uh, another lawyer cautioned me when I started in law at about the age of 40, it'll eat your life, and it did. Um, so my writing at the moment, I have a number of larger projects that are just backburnered. Um, but I also, so it's pretty well articles, book reviews, songs, believe it or not, a bit of self-amusement with the writing. And the law, other than that, consumes everything. It is the sort of thing that keeps you up nights. It uh, is extremely stressful, extremely hard, and extremely important. You know, I, I chose an area of law where I really do get to help people with problems that have uh, come up, which I find very gratifying. But like I said, it does keep me up nights. I get terribly worried about my clients and their situations, because there's only so much a lawyer can do to help sometimes. But um, anyway, it's an interesting and varied <laughs> couple of occupations that I ended up tumbling into. So, and I do have, I'm very pleased to have a couple of major works, well, one major and one I wrote for the money, works on the bookshelves. So, you know, it's, it's okay. It's pretty much what I'd hoped for. So. Thank you very much. Um, so for students who, uh, many students I interact with um, ask, pose a question about, um, you know, what can they do with their degree? What, what are the many different, like, among the many different options that are available to them? How do they decide what's the best fit and so forth? So um, I'm going to ask our panelists, how did you decide? What prompted you to pursue further education um, in the area that you chose? Um, and are you glad you did? Omar? Yeah, um, when I came to York, I mean, you can get kind of lost in, I think, in the maze here at York. And one of the things, when I first started, I, um, um, I got into the School of Health Policy and Management, which used to be part of Atkinson College. And I just found it was really nice being in this, uh, being at Atkinson College, because it was smaller. So in amongst, you know, a bigger, uh, a big, uh, you know, being at York University and being so big, it was nice to have kind of a home. And um, so I started out with the School of Health Policy and Management, and uh, I, I liked the issues and things that were that we were discussing, and we were very fortunate, especially with Atkinson College, because a lot of the uh, students who were in the program, they actually were in the field. So you were not only getting kind of the academic piece of it, but you were getting the practical piece of it as well. And, uh, you know, in my third year, I kind of decided I wanted to become a health policy advisor, knowing with an undergraduate, pro with an undergraduate degree, I didn't know if I could really get into being an advisor in the government. Um, so I had to pursue some other, you know, look at other options, see what would allow me to be able to become a policy advisor within the government. And, uh, you know, doing my homework, doing my research, and speaking to other people, I found out that there was a really good program at Queen's, which is a Master's of Public Administration, and it has a very good reputation within the Ontario Public Service, as well as the federal government. So I applied to that, and I got in, and, uh, and I did the program. I had a job before I even finished, so it really worked out very nicely for me. But 
I think the, the thing that I lead with all of you is, is that you're kind of responsible not only for your academic career, but for your, for your own professional career. And so you should invest as much as you can. Just like Susan was saying, is that you've got to take advantage of the resources you have here. Because the message that I leave with you guys is that you guys are paying for that. So use it. Just don't let them, you know, take your money away. So you guys should really focus on using some of these resources. I'm sorry I'm being blunt, but I'm remembering my <laughs> days back here, so. Um, I, I guess I have a number of reasons why I decided to do an MA uh, in history or I guess more broadly in the social sciences. Um, I was just interested in sort of carrying on the sort of intellectual, just the intellectual value of, of study, you know, it, an MA is, you know, considerably more advanced than the fourth year classes that you're taking and, and so for that reason alone I was just interested in carrying on a deeper study of, of history or in other cases uh, you would do other things. Um, but it does, I also got the impression be, as an undergraduate looking to an MA that it opens more doors. Like if you have an MA and then uh, do a teaching degree, you can, you can have a better, like you have better job options once you have the MA sort of in the bank, even if you want to then go on to law school or a teacher's college. What uh, really prompted me though, in my personal case to do an MA is that I wanted to do a PhD. Uh, and that I actually decided fairly early in my undergraduate that I really loved university. I really wanted to spend time in this sort of environment of um, setting your own schedule and just sort of thinking about things and uh, researching <coughs> and learning things. Um, uh, so in my case, it was sort of the stepping stone to doing a PhD and the ultimate goal of getting a job uh, as a professor at a university. Um, and the other thing for me, uh, and it's not the case for a lot of people who also want to become professor at university, but for me it was travel and depending what you study in graduate school, graduate school is a wonderful way uh, to continue uh, uh, traveling, but in sort of not as a tourist, but sort of living abroad for six to 12 month periods. Um, and so in the second year of my MA, I went on a York exchange to Berlin. Um, and then during my PhD, I, I spent both time in Germany and, and Argentina. Um, and so that was sort of, I always tell myself that even if, you know, at the end of the day, I don't end up staying in universities. One of the reasons I did this was for the experience of the PhD. And, and in my case, it was uh, the intellectual inquiry and the travel. Um. I work in a, in a field that's pretty static, doesn't change much, and it's been like that for some time. Uh, coming to York in 2004 when I did my fine arts degree, um, I was in visual arts. I don't paint or draw anymore, but what I took from that was a lot of creativity, a lot of skills that developed from it. And I went into the field, like I was saying, that's been static and not changing for so long, and I. I was kind of taken back by it. I saw that there was much change to be made. And with um, the reality of it is the, the change makers, the people that make the decisions within um, a publicly funded um, organization like the TDSB, Toronto District School Board, uh, they're the people that are educated representing obviously a school board. So um, I thought the best way to sort of take on what I thought to be my next leadership role to make those changes and implement things that I thought to be what uh, the board could use, was to um, look at what my practice entailed, what the, the school board itself needed, what the whole larger picture of education within the province of Ontario looked like, and would, a, would an MED, would graduate studies help me to um, sort of work with that and push my, my thoughts ahead. So I looked, um, when I got to that realization, I looked at both OISE and York, and I picked York because York allows for a little bit more flexibility in terms of what it is that you, you want to do with your graduate studies. Um, OISE, so U of T, um, was a lot more specialized and uh, a lot more siloed and streamed. Um, you know, if you wanted to get into educational administration, you take these courses and move ahead in this manner. If you wanted to take uh, teaching and learning or curriculum development or, or whatever it was, you've had a track that you go on. Um, York is more of a, a big sandbox and you've got your requirements you've got to fulfill but you're you're more free in how you're going to fulfill them so I thought that was a great environment for me to sort of um, get my hands dirty in uh, an, another environment I, I went to school part-time as I obviously worked full-time in another environment that allows you to get your hands messy and work with ideas so simultaneously I think it was good to do both at the same time because they played off one another and um, ultimately I did it so that I can move up through the ranks, but also more for, um, like it was kind of mentioned there, thinking about myself and as a professional, what it is that I wanted to take from the experience um, and what it is that I wanted to have as sort of a, a core base knowledge for myself to feel 
um, just in the decisions that I made and informed and that type of thing. So um, I think it helped to fulfill a lot of those um, a lot of those needs that I had. Okay, well, I'm a really bad example to follow in terms of career planning because I just stumbled into everything and have been very lucky. And York was great. I mean, it, when I was here, the sandbox metaphor is, is terrific because my undergrad, which was a, an honors degree in English literature and creative writing, was the, the time of my life. I hated my law degree. Um, I was a single mother of twins at the time. They were teenagers. It was just awful, you know, but that wasn't uh, Osgood's fault. Um, I, uh, you know, I always wanted to be a writer and a lawyer in some ways. They were the two little passions I had. I wrote, you know, when I, I had my first stuff published when I was 13. But um, it's very hard to be a writer. It's probably harder than being a lawyer in its own way because there's some isolation. And, and of course, there's, I'm sorry to rain on your parade if anybody does have aspirations to be a writer you're not going to be able to survive. Like, there's only a handful of us that manage to get through. So you got to have a backup. You know, I mean, yes, there's the, the guys who hit the ball out of the park and the Fifty Shades of Grey dames and stuff like that. <laughs> but I'm sorry. I was a best-selling Canadian author. And with my grant money, you know, which is a lottery, et cetera, uh, you know, I, I mean, the best I ever made was 30 grand a year. You know, and I made that for one year. <laughs> so... Um, and you know, you have to be able to survive. Uh, certainly writers do manage to survive. Uh, they augment with little paid gigs, uh, they, you know, they write to web content, you know, um, they freelance, but it's very, very tough and it's a very different thing. If you're gonna be a fiction writer, a novelist, you, you've gotta have a backup. I once spoke in a uh, uh, panel for um, Humber uh, School of Writers uh, with um, several other lawyers who are also writers. There's a lot of lawyers have arts degrees. I would say more of us have arts degrees than business degrees. There's an incredible amount of artistry in uh, artists among lawyers, but also artistry in the law. It depends on what area of law you're in. I write every day. I write <laughs> so much stuff every day. And it's, you know, I hear stories and then, you know, they, you, you have to f actually reduce it to something that's um, consumable for you know whatever adjudicator might be viewing it you have to be convincing um, you can't be prolix <laughs> which I am one, one of the other lawyers said I write pleadings like I'm writing more in peace but um, uh, you know it, it's I ended wanted to be a writer so badly and I ended up here at night school uh, taking a, uh, uh, in a creative writing course at night school and realized this was when I was in my late 30s, I think, and I just had to get in here full time, so I did. When I graduated, when I finished it, I was writing full time, but I had my husband supporting me, and then the marriage broke up, and I had to go back to being a legal secretary. And I was a legal secretary for a couple of years before I realized, I can't do this anymore, you know. And I, you know, basically did my own Diane Mason thing of, you know, I'll give it up to the universe. I'm sorry, that's my career plan, <laughs> right? <laughs> I wrote the uh, I wrote the um, the LSAT and applied for a Canada Council grant at the same time, or um, and figured, well, I'll never pass the LSAT because I'm actually a moron, and uh, it turned out I wasn't to my surprise, um, and then uh, figured that you know I'd, I'd taken a kick at the Canada Council a few times and never got the money and. But, you know, I got both of them and ended up having to finish the novel because law school was starting, <laughs> you know, so the, law, the novel I'd been working on for four or five years, I had to finish it because law school was starting in, in September. So there's, you know, did I make a plan? Did I have any leadership ideas? No, I was trying to survive and I was trying to do what my heart told me to do, which, you know, works sometimes if you're lucky. I don't know whether we should, I should be encouraging you to rely on luck, <laughs> but the artist part of me always did, and the artist part of me has, has had some very good luck. So, and you know, now I, with the lawyering, I still have the same personality. My sister often says, you know, you have the brains to be a lawyer, but you don't have the constitution. You know, <laughs> I'm the one who cries in front of the judge, right? <laughs> which is not persuasive, trust me. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, I just, and York was great. Uh, I didn't take advantage of any career stuff, I'm sorry. 
I did go to all the, the talks with the other writers. Um, as for the lawyering stuff, I was just, in law school, I was just, <laughs> please God, let me pass this exam. What are they talking about for three years? <laughs> so, and then I got the job I got with a nice little firm in the West End, and not that little, and I'm still there now, where I get to do what I want. I, I get to choose what clients, what cases I want to take, you know, so. So it sounds like, although each of you, um, what prompted each of you to pursue a further education is what was different, um, you all pretty much agree that it was a good choice, right? Yeah, that you're happy that you made the choice. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like you still do, even though <laughs> there might be some days that you may, you may question that. Um, but Diane, I want to pick up on something that you said earlier um, about not not being possibly the best role model, like the best model in terms of a, a career plan or something something along those lines. You get the, uh, the tumbleweed method yeah, of career planning. Yeah. But you know what, I think each of you um, have has your own career story and, and um, educational journey um, and probably each of you speaks to different students here that are all, you know, are probably facing very similar situations or similar questions that you faced when you were at those, at that point in your life. So my next question um, is about the program that you chose um, to go into. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, so first of all, thinking back to your own, your own journey and the, the, the experience of applying to the program that you chose. Um, can you think of any tips, things that you wish you had known when you were applying, that um, advice to students who are considering getting into your program, um, what would you offer to them in terms of how, how to stand out as candidates, how to stand out um, as part of the application process? Um, Omar, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I, I'm just trying to think of that question because um, I'm not kind of an example of that as much. I mean, just coming out of high school, it was more about grades. That was kind of the focus back then, many <coughs> years ago. Um, but I know it's becoming much more competitive for you folks than it was for me long, like, you know, I mean, I'm talking early um, 2000s, so. Um, but I would say is that, you know what, again, I just, I would honestly, like, I would urge all of you is that, you know, you just have to, to take uh, advantage of the resources you have. So if you're applying to something, go and meet with someone from the program. Like, you know, go and talk to them, because it makes a real big difference when you have that face-to-face -face contact and you're able to touch base with people because if you fill out your application and say the person who's reviewing your application goes, you know what, I, I met this person. Yeah, I know Omar, you know, I saw him. It, 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 makes, it, it does create a very, I think, a, a big difference. So I'd say that and I'd say that, you know, I think the standard things is that, you know, would have a lot of kind of uh, extracurricular activities, volunteer, those kinds of things. But I think, like, I didn't have all that. I had mainly grades. And, uh, and the thing that I would leave with you folks is just go and meet with people. It makes the biggest difference, not only for, I'd say, the programs you want to get into, but into the jobs you want to get into. People see that, you know what, you're actually taking the initiative. You're contacting them. You want to be in this. You, you're going to you know, take that extra step. So that's what I would encourage you folks to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so so what, what to know when applying? I guess for an MA. Um, it depends a lot at the graduate level, it depends a lot more on the department by, by department basis rather than the university's name overall. Um, so to find out that you need to basically talk to a professor in the field that you want to go into. So if you want to do sociology or you want to do political science, it'd be a lot more fruitful to know that UBC is a better place than U of T or in fact that York has a really good history program because um, just from, from a, a outside of, if you're not at York, you, don't, you would never have thought of going to York for a graduate degree unless someone told you that they have a really good history program. Um, uh, there's a lot of information on each department. So you go to the department's website and there's a lot of information on each department's website and one a really important one is funding. So you get, you get paid to go to graduate school. You don't pay the university anymore. Um, but uh, uh, McGill isn't going to give you any money to do an MA. Uh, they'll give you money for a PhD, but they won't give you any money for an MA. So find out where they do give you money to do an MA. And York is a place that will uh, give you about $10,000 for an MA, and then you pay tuition. So you know you get a $5,000 scholarship, and you pay and your tuition's free, um, and you work a, a sm like a 10-hour-a-week job. 
Um, and you might find out that Waterloo also pays, and you find out that U of T doesn't, doesn't fund MA students, only pays students. And so things like this, it's on their website usually, and it's when you send an email to the, like the graduate coordinator. Uh, so things like that, finding out where to go. Uh, it's all, about graduate studies, it's all about following the money. That's how you'll do the best research when you have more money. Um, and then so I would suggest talking to your, an undergraduate prof in the field, not just in, in the field of, say, history, but in the country's history that you want to do. Um, so if you're, you really like your fourth year German history professor, but you want to do Canadian history as a graduate student, that German history professor is not the, not the absolute best person to tell you. But they're not a bad person, but there's more specific discipline or country-specific information. So contact, talk to an undergraduate professor and a, um, a, prof a potential supervisor at the universities you're thinking of applying to. So try to find the Canadian historian at the University of Waterloo <coughs> who you think would supervise your project on immigration or nursing or whatever and you know, suggest your project and see what they say about it and tell you, see what they tell you about the program. Um, I go about things really systematically and organized. So I applied, I think it was uh, close to two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago, to the MED program. And what I did literally was I created a spreadsheet. This builds off a lot of what Benjamin was saying. Made up a spreadsheet, what each program sort of their their whole uh, mission statement was, what their goals were, what it was that I could sort of come away with after going to this type of program. So for each school, U of T, Western, whatever school it was that I was looking at. Um, and then I had within that same spreadsheet, like Benjamin was saying, the main contact for the grad program at that school. So that systematic sort of spreadsheet really helped me to figure out, um, and I would add to it, you know, as I would talk to somebody or make contacts, um, what benefits or drawbacks were for a specific school, literally would type it in and um, have that resource available to refer to. So I would say be systematic and organized in all of your ventures. So in all your discussions, document everything so that you can always refer back to it. That's something that I did. And I think at this point in time, there's there's a lot, uh, many more affordances that we can use online, such as um, if you follow, for example, I know that York U, all of the different uh, departments should have a Twitter handle and they'll be tweeting. I know that uh, uh, specifically the uh, graduate office and the faculty of education, they tweet stuff all the time. So I started following them and saw what they were all about. And I saw that a lot of their interests fed into what I wanted to do and that, that was a decision that let me into uh, to where I went. Um, Facebook, check out their Facebook pages. That's how they want to get exposure and get people to come to their school. So I did that a lot and I saw you know, how are they interacting with um, sort of the, the new student? What mandates do they have in place to sort of get connections and establish relationships with students coming into the program? Because really, you know, they're connecting to the demographics that would use online resources like Facebook and Twitter. So, you know, how are they handling that? That was a ga another gauge that I used to see where it was that I was going to go. Um, the application process for myself, um, I know that Omar, you mentioned Mark's. For me, it was a lot. It was marks, but they also wanted a component uh, in dealing with um, your interpersonal skills. So, uh, if you know that you've got to establish a set of references, which you're probably going to have to do, um, try to think of the relationships you've had with those people, and think back to um, maybe a time where you not only were able to highlight yourself within a situation where you had a time of growth, and maybe use a person like that for a reference where they can attest to sort of seeing you grow like you would grow in school. So I had several kind of references like that. I didn't just go to the professors or the, the principals that I knew that, you know, they knew I, I made an impact on a, sort of a one-off type thing where they saw some sort of growth that they, can, they could speak to. Um, and I think the last thing I would say is go to the school and absorb the atmosphere. See what it's all about. Take a day trip. Just see what it's, see what it's like. So I think it fits a lot, again, into what Benjamin was saying, um, feeding off of what, uh, what the vibes are and from people, from places, and, you know, from whatever information you can absorb. So, yeah. But in terms of being a writer post-grad, there are post-grad programs available. Um, you can get MFAs, et cetera, if you get an English degree or you get a creative writing degree. But I understand that you have to have a body of work for that that is vetted. Um, I do have friends who have gone on to MFAs in creative writing, um, we, either with an undergrad in creative writing or with a uh, an English degree. Um, you know the whether those uh, actually you know get you to a point where if it depends on what you consider a successful career. Is it I am self-supporting using you know writing as my my living, or whether I'm happy doing my writing and I 
you know, also have to do something else um, to pay the bills, uh, including applying to the government for, uh, for grants. Um, applying to an MFA program, of course, involves a portfolio of work. You know, you should definitely be accumulating portfolios, definitely hanging around with other writers, constant submissions to, to literary magazines, very tough to get into. Nothing has changed since then, uh, since I was uh, first writing, which at this point is probably pushing 20 years. Now, getting into law school, on the other hand, um, is just plain a grind. Uh, and uh, you write your LSAT. I encourage you to take uh, the, the LSAT courses. Um, I have a very unmathematical brain, and some portions of them are math, but there are tricks to get you around that. It's apparently, I understand Boolean algebra, which to me, you know, I mean, I've got grade eight math. It's tricky for me. Um, but I still managed to do well enough that the two schools that I applied to uh, both accepted me despite, uh, uh, you know, not having a stellar mark. And I chose this school because it was close to my home. Um, but uh, when you're writing your LSAT, do, you know, avail yourself of the, the actual technical resources. And by all means, take a course if your mark's low. But you're in with a big pool of, of competitors. It's hard to get in. It's hard to finance. Um, there's a saying about law school that I think it's the first year they scare you to death, the second year they work you to death, and the third year they bore you to death. Um, you know, I, because of my situation, didn't avail myself of the stuff that was available at law school. Law school was a lot more fun for other people than it was for me. Um, but there's lots of career stuff in, in your, your law degree. And there's post uh, MAs in, in, in law that you can pursue after that. Um, if you are applying to law school, you are going to be, you know, at the same level as everybody else when you start out. But watch in your first year for what you like doing. I thought that I was too emotional a person to be involved in anything, you know, like civil litigation. And as a result, I took business courses the second year and second year, and it was just, I was stultifyingly bored, confused, and it was all about the money, and it was all about the forms, and it was, I'm sorry, it was all about the money, and it was more about the money, and it was more about the money, and I just am not a money sort of person. So the third year I worked for the Innocence Project, um, helped get a guy who'd been in jail for 30 years out of jail, um, and, uh, you know, his conviction overturned, it was part of that. Um, I wrote a research paper on, this was before same-sex marriage was legalized, I wrote a, wrote a, a lengthy paper on uh, uh, transgendered marriage and that was treated under uh, law globally. I had a lot better time in third year because I just said, you know, okay, I'm an emotional person, I'm going to go into areas of law that accept a certain amount of eccentricity. So I had really fantasized that I'd be able to continue being a novelist and continue writing when I got into law and actually started practicing. That has not happened. I still write. But in terms of your applications, in terms of what you're choosing to do, law is very generic when you're applying. You're going to be the same shirt and the same black suit with the white shirt as everybody as you proceed and in terms of your choice of schools, smaller law schools are a good idea. Don't eschew going to an American school. One of the lawyers at our work was a young man who could not get into any of the Canadian schools. His LSAT mark was too low. He's a great lawyer. He went to Detroit and he came back. He loved Detroit. He came back. He had to do some equivalency stuff for a year with, uh, I think it was Osgood or Lost Side. Who knows? He had to do an extra year. Who cares? He's a great lawyer. Um, so, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because you don't want to go to the States. You get, you get the same degree. You get the same education. It's a common law world. So, and then you have to decide, you know, don't ever think you're going to be in it for the money because there's a lot of work shortage with lawyers right now. And I know a couple of bankrupt lawyers, okay? <laughs> um, we don't all live in really expensive houses. You know, I drive a beat up old Hyundai, mostly by choice. But, um, you know, the question was about the applications to post-grad stuff. Writers, I don't think it's changed much. Law, try to still try to follow what your interest is as opposed to following the money. Because you're going to be working really hard. You might as well do it about something you give a damn about. So. I think that's sort of a theme from all of you that if you're deciding uh, to pursue further education, first of all, uh, and you're trying to decide which program would be the best fit, you need to look at what your interests are what you hope to achieve, where you want to go with this. 
um, and then what was, you know, um, what program or institution uh, would be um, the best fit for you given your goals and your interests and strengths and so forth, your values, and, and go from there. So I'm going to ask one last question, and then I'm going to open the discussion to questions from the floor. So that'll give you a bit of time to uh, work up the nerve to ask our panelists some questions. Okay, so um, panelists, if you could, thinking back to the your programs, um, what did you enjoy most about your respective program, and what did you in, uh, find most challenging? Um, so uh, what I would say is that um, when I joined the School of Health Policy and Management, that was their, I think, first or second year. So there was a lot of excitement amongst the faculty in terms of, you know, this was a new program. They really wanted to build it. They were very excited and passionate about it. Um, so that was a great piece of it. And the class sizes were much smaller. So there was that opportunity for a lot of discussion, um, which sometimes you don't get in some of the classes, some of the courses uh, that York offers where you're in this big lecture hall and you have maybe 500 people with you. And lastly, I would say is that uh, because School of Health Policy Management was part of Atkinson at that point, we had a lot of students who were actually in the field and they were taking courses. So again, it goes back to that same thing is that you're not only getting that academic portion of it, you're really getting the practical, what's happening out there, and that gives you some really good insight. So I think. Those were three very key things in that program that, I, I mean, that for me were very, very strong. And what about your Master's of Public Administration? Yeah, I would say that, you know, I mean, the really great thing about the School of Health Policy and Management was it really prepared me to do a Master's in Public Administration, just, you know, in terms of the workload, um, how much we had to write, and uh, so that really prepared me well. And with the School of Health, po I mean, sorry, with my Master's in Public Administration, it was very good again because we had a lot of senior management, ex-senior management, like deputy ministers and uh, political staff who had retired and were actually teaching in the course, uh, teaching courses in that program, and that was just incredible. I can tell you, we had a deputy minister. Uh, one course I took, which was in immigration, at uh, my, in my Master's in Public Administration, and it was like a deputy minister's briefing the first day. Like we had to read. I think it was, I'm telling you, it was like four books we had to read, and she just sat there, and I know now, working in the public service, she, it was like briefing a deputy. I mean, everybody's high, like blood pressure was up to here, I'm telling you, because she would just ask you a question. Tell me about this, and it's like you're, you know, you're taken back, and so I think that was very, very good for, for me, at least, so. And what did you find most challenging about the program? The Masters of Public Administration? Um, the, most uh, the thing that I would find the most challenging is you have the best of the best in the program. So they, you challenge each other and you find that you, know, you have to really be at your best because you're dealing with people who are, uh, you know, who are at a different caliber. That I, that's what I found. And I mean, the nice thing with our program is we had 55 students and we worked day and night. Like I'm telling you, it was, it's a one-year program, so it's extremely intense. You have to take 12 courses, <coughs> like I'm sure everybody else has, uh, has dealt with as well. So um, the nice thing was is that you're all in the same boat, so you're working really hard together, and you form friendships that, I mean, I'm going to have lifelong friendships with some of the people that I did my master's with, which, uh, which for me is the most rewarding thing. So. Thank you. Benjamin. Um, I feel that's... Uh, a difficult question. Um, I guess I could say something, the, something simple, just like the intellectual uh, advancement that uh, uh, graduate work in the humanities does is, is really great. Um, I also, maybe more concretely, I also like the freedom. Uh, it's, it's a whole lot of work, and I'm, I definitely work more than 40 hours a week, um, but the pl t number of hours I have to be somewhere at a very specific time is very low. It's only it's only three hours a week that I have to do something. So if I want to sleep in every day until noon, I could. Um, but what ends up happening is I actually wake up every day at 7 a.m. and work Saturdays and Sundays. So it's not actually freedom, but there is a freedom out there. If I want to take a day off, I can, and I really like that. Or if I want to ex go to a conference and extend the trip by three days and spend another three days in Chicago, I can do it, and no one has, I'm, it's totally within my, my, my I'm free to do so. Um, so so the lifestyle, that the graduate work, and then also being a professor is that, is that same uh, the commitment. You have certain meetings, but I mean, you, you have those days every week that you, ha you can do whatever you want. Uh, what ends up is you work those days and you work the Sundays, but um, you could, if you, if you didn't want to, you don't have to. Um, the thing I would like least about, I would say, a PhD in anywhere in the social sciences and humanities um, is the uncertainty of what comes next. Now, 
I'm told by people outside of the university system there are all there are lots of uh, options out there for people with PhDs. In fact, Omar was just telling me about uh, the public service as another option. I know people who've gotten jobs with the Ministry of Education or the Foreign Service. Um, the PhD wasn't necessary for those jobs, but you got a PhD then you got that kind of job. Um, but if you if your goal or the reason you did seven years of graduate work is to become a professor at a university, um, it's very uncertain what will happen. You'll you will not end up in Toronto. You will end up either in Pittsburgh, which would be a success story, and a failure would be in like Lethbridge, Alberta. Um, um, well, that would actually be a success story too because you ended up getting a job. Uh, so it's very uncertain um, uh, of what happens. I mean, there's you're so spe specialized in this thing that you can only apply for 15 or 20 jobs and there's 80 other people applying for them. So it's, it's this sort of uncertainty. And, and you think or you tell yourself that you will be the one, you know, be the chosen one who gets the job at U of T, but it's unlikely or it's un you're very unclear until it actually happens. So there's very un uncertain what happens next. Three years from now, I'll be working in an embassy in Berlin. It'll be awesome, but I do not know that right now. And so it's just this uncertainty. Um, I would say to anybody who's wanting to do any kind of graduate work, and I realized this when I was sitting on stage about to do the whole convocation thing, Take it as um, cherish it, cherish what you're doing. Because I jumped through the hoops, I did this, got the assignment done, met this deadline, did all the busy work, but all that while I didn't really appreciate what I was doing for myself and maybe the impact it had on others. And it wasn't until, and this is for real, um, it wasn't until I was on the stage and I kind of was in that moment with the experience of finishing it, did I actually realize, okay, I actually did something pretty substantial. And looking back on it, I think that um, I missed a lot of opportunities to enjoy it a lot more. So obviously there's a lot of stresses that come with it, as, as there is in any sort of academic situation. But um, look at that stress and sort of um, unravel it. And what benefits does it bring to you immediately? I think that's something that um, may give you a little bit more drive and, and uh, passion within the moment. Obviously, you know, if you're going to finish something like a master's or PhD program, it's going to have some hopefully long-term effects for you, but what are those short-term bursts of um, of drive that you can get from from achieving um, whatever it is you're working on right then and there? Um, w thinking back again, obviously, um, like Omar had said, the relationships that you form because you're with the same people. Um, sometimes it was three times a week because I took a, I did mine as a part-time so part-time student, and I did it in two years. And most of the people that did the same thing as me, we would see each other quite frequently. And that support network, those people that you could you know, quickly rely on to, to would do whatever with uh, in terms of your studies, that's something that um, I really enjoyed most because, uh, like Omar had said, you still have a connection after it's all done. And if they're within the same field, you know, my field, it's really um, you're either in the TDSB or you're in the York board or you don't have a job because that's the way it is right now. You know, you're really um, closely knit in terms of your experiences at work. So that support network is something that I think is crucial. The last thing that um, that I think I enjoyed most was developing relationships with professors that um, is far different from the relationships you would develop with a professor at an undergraduate level. Um, I know in your fourth year, and um, possibly for others maybe before that, you get a little bit closer in terms of. Uh, relationships with professors and seminars and that type of thing. But I found that um, it kind of blew me away at the beginning where you can sit down and tell somebody what you want to do and they're waiting for you to tell them with a pen in hand. Um, and you're kind of waiting for their validation but it's really your validation that matters. So writing your own story and figuring out what it is that um, matters to you and having somebody there to support you um, rather than you know looking for that validation from them um, as you would have before. So uh, I think that's something that I really, I really did enjoy. Um, something that I, I didn't enjoy was, um, I don't have anything to say because I, I, I did like it all. I, you know, it was at points tedious, obviously, but that's what you sign up for. So um, I think that, you know, it was, it was a positive experience as a whole. Right, uh, really different. The Bachelor of Education was um, a hoop to jump through, to get uh, a piece of paper, to get a job. I'll be, I'll be honest, that's obviously what it is. And 
if you get a job, that's great. And I think what led me to do my MED was the fact that, okay, I like this. This is something that I would like to pursue further. How can I specialize or how can I make this more about me rather than, you know, these uh, siloed courses that I have to take? So the MED was, I would say, I think it was mentioned earlier as well, it's a lot more customizable. You can you determine what it is that you want to do, why you want to do it, and if it's not validated by yourself, then what's the point? So, um, like I developed a, a, a new form of, of teaching and learning that I wrote about in my thesis that I think is something that I can put into practice in my classroom. Whereas with my BA, just uh, the bachelor's degree, I wouldn't have had that experience, or I wouldn't have been in the place to have that experience. So it was. it's all about um, the type of environment that uh, that the program facilitates. Yeah. Again, so what did you uh, enjoy most, and what did you find most challenging about um, doing your law degree? Well, the you know I was a slightly different law student because I was a mature student in some ways. Um, I was old. Okay, I was forty when I started, but I was not a mature student because I'd only finished my undergrad three years before, and you're not qualified to get in as a mature student and, and uh, skip some of the other processes. Uh, uh, you're allowed in with a lower LSAT, for instance, um, if you've been out of uh, undergrad for, I think it's five years or something for the mature student. So regardless, what I did was I looked for um, support networks because it was really different from my arts degree. <laughs> and um, some, to some extent, I didn't know what I really wanted to be there. I did see people drop out within two weeks. There was one guy who was a poet who uh, just, you know, he after a week and a half, he said, goodbye everybody, and he literally walked out. Um, a little less, uh, it's really hard to say what I enjoyed. I did meet like-minded souls. I think that was really important. I met some of the brightest and most creative and most wonderful people there. Um, I've maintained a couple of those relationships afterwards. So I did enjoy little mature student groups. I wish I had more time to do some of the other stuff. I loved the writing, although it was very different writing from creative writing. I still loved it. I loved writing my papers, you know, be up all night writing the paper and toying with it. Didn't like footnoting, it's different footnoting. But, um, and that was practical, very practical for future uh, legal writing, which is a lot of involved in it. So yeah, really the social stuff that I did manage to do, I wish I'd done more. I couldn't, I was a single mom. You know, it just wasn't possible. Um, there's lots of other stuff that you can do that's uh, in law school, especially at Oz. You can get involved with Parkdale Legal, you can get involved with the Innocence Project. There's a lot of cool stuff. But the time, and it's, it's just so different. And this was from somebody who'd been in law for so long, you know. Um, I don't know what, you, what I didn't like. Um, there was a lot of it I didn't like because it was just so different. I missed being an artist terribly. Um, and it was very consumptive. Uh, reading 16th century contract cases, which are still relevant to this day, was really hard. But I found, and I would find myself picking out phrases in these things and, and, and writing poems about them, you know, um, because they, they were just the most wonderful phrases and I'd feel so completely isolated that there wasn't anybody else who thought that the phrase temporary perfection was so beautiful when it actually relates to personal property security legislation and how it continues when you cross the border. <laughs> you know, but temporary perfection to me. And lots of other things. Um, I did, try not to be too isolated in law school and try not to be com too competitive, unlike uh, I believe what Omar said, where there was a lot of everybody working together, let's all row together for Harvard. Oh boy, that does not apply in law school. I never ran into that myself. Um, you know, uh, the other thing that was really unpleasant was what they call, uh, I always called a cattle call audition. Um, they were off campus interviews, and you know, if your marks were high enough, and to my shock in second year, I was straight A's. You know, this was in the business. Uh, you know, oh, I did that with, a gra <laughs> with grade eight arithmetic. Um, it, it still, they, they uh, the, what happens is the big law firms set up these cattle call auditions where you all show up and they're off campus interviews for these highly prized articling and summering jobs that you have to do because you're getting nailed for this incredible tuition and you're there with like 1500 other people all dressed in the same black suit and white shirt you know and you're the old one and you know um, you know you're not going to get a job you only got the, you know the other kids are saying kids sorry are saying 
well, how many interviews have you got? Oh, I've got 17, and you've got one. <laughs> you know, um, quite often I understand the law schools won't even look at the mature students, which is uh, dumb because, you know, we're the best workers. But they assume that we're going to have to get home to our kids. Well, yeah, but <laughs> we're also going to take the work with us. We're also going to get done a lot quicker. Um, that was a miserable experience, the off-campus interviews. But uh, I did end up landing a job through an, uh, for one summer for an off-campus interview and hated it. Ended up going back to the little law firm that I'd summered for the year before and a job that I found myself, and I'm still with that law firm. I articled there. So uh, best experiences were the social stuff, the intellectual stuff, absolutely, the writing. It was, some of it was so cool, the words. As a wordsmith, I really liked the words. Um, uh, as the worst stuff was the isolation, the selfishness, and the, um, I feel, misplaced focus on the economics r return of lawyering. You know, there's a reason there's lawyer jokes out there. We give a terrible impression. And, you know, I don't like lawyer jokes, but some of them are well earned. So. Interesting. Um, so um, now it's time for questions from the audience. So if anybody has a question, feel free to stand up um, and um, uh, we'll take your questions. Anthony, I don't have a question. I just say that thank you so much for all your story. It really motivates, very motivating. Like the most thing I learned from all of you that you have a lot of passion, you have love for doing, for earn a living, I don't want to walk to death. I love that so much because I'm old. I go back to the The reason I have to go back to the so old because I left my country due to a communist. In my country, all oh, your career is not my dream. I need to love all my dream. My, my mother is a teacher. She want me to become a teacher. She told me so bad. I said, honey, be a teacher. And you got three months in the vacation to be with your children. That's all she wants. And then I said, no, I want to be a writer. She said, you have no money in the writer, don't do that. And even I straight A, A blood I want 100% everything subject that. And I told mom, but I really love writing. She said, there are no money there. And you have kids, you have no time. <laughs> so anyway, but I think in that, because my dream to be a writer, be famous. Just like I keep drawing, that's my dream, right? Then I can be work for public in the political and correct thing, right? So, oh, that's really, by 30 years old, I achieve everything, right? But then coming to over, I left. I came and had 10 years to study my English to be good. And I came and had college. I got a distinction as well. All my subjects like a computer, robotic, electrical. So do you have a question for our panel? Yeah, but my question, I said, I did come and thank you so much for everything like that. And that all your career, all your talk is so valuable. I hope all young people here learn from it. Because we will think about money, money. That's not. Now I'm 56 years old. I think that the passion is the most key bond to go for the career that you can live for it. Like a, the history, I love history so much. I think that's the best thing I can do. If you know history, you can get advanced so many things. Even right there, you know, right there, the history is the best. Thank you for so your thank comments. You so much. Thank, yeah. you. Um, thank you. Thank you to our panelists. I, I agree. I love um, <laughs> Does anybody have a question for our panelists? Diane? Um, how important do you find that you find networking um, to get your current, current position or your um, first job? So how important? Always being involved in like student government possibly or mm -hmm. venturing or being involved in the community or anything like that? Okay, I'm just going to repeat the question for the camera. So question about um, <coughs> networking and being involved in um, with, like extracurricular activities or community service, that kind of thing. So getting to know people, um, um, how important is that um, in terms of, uh, for, to help you get a job um, or as you move forward in your career? Um, within my field, you know, I'm sure you've heard it's hard to get a job as a teacher, that type of thing. Um, I think establishing a professional brand for yourself, getting together um, some thoughts in your mind about what it is that you're all about, what your core values are, um, you know, who you are and then, you know, secondly, what you've learned in school specific to the job that you're pursuing. Take those together and develop sort of like a branding campaign, you know. That could be as simple as um, when you're out there scouting for jobs, developing those interpersonal relationships. So whether for me it was to go into a school and introduce myself or 
if it is whatever it is the field that you are going wherever to introduce yourself and just to establish that connection um, I feel within the age of all of this electronic communication that that authentic piece gets lost and I've heard again and again that people they tell me when I when I went through this process you're the only one that's come in and actually put a face to the resume and you've come in and you know sort of spoken more to what it is that you can do so I think that that personal interpersonal uh, piece is is key um, and then you can move on from there and I've developed sort of like business cards or resume highlight card and given those out and always being prepared and you know people have people within uh, the field of education like I alluded to earlier it's really static and anyone that looks to be progressive looks to be bending the rules or sort of changing what they've been doing for a while and that's not good for them so uh, being aware that sort of those sort of tendencies are around and anything that you do to push yourself forward you may get resistance from others so in developing the brand that I created for myself I put together a website I made brochures I did all that and it's like I was selling a house but I was selling what the skills I had that you know I could bring to the table and it worked well because I got a job before I graduated and I worked at that job for three months and the school board found out that I didn't graduate yet it was just a paperwork delay and then they fired me from that job but that job that I got fired from it's actually it's it's pretty cool how it happened that job led to the next job the school down the street which wouldn't have happened if I didn't um, land that first job by doing what I did in terms of um, developing the brand and again they said that you know they hadn't seen that type of thing before so it stood out and I think that's another point what what do you have that you can bring to the table I know it's kind of cliche but what do you have that somebody else doesn't have or even I think more specifically what are you willing to do that somebody kind of would take a back seat to uh, so that's job led me to the one down the street and from there I got my permanent contract and that was that so I think if I didn't do what I did in terms of putting in you know a few hours work creating a card or a few days work developing a website I wouldn't have sort of mapped that uh, progress the way I did so I think it's effort it's about effort and what you're willing to do because if you're willing to put in that extra effort and I know the people in the circle that I'm with uh, in terms of friends a lot of them aren't willing to do that extra step so it makes you stand out and I think that's something that's uh, true within my field I'm not sure with others but I, I've seen that uh, pretty well uh, pretty well be reality yeah I would I, I would say that every job that I've gotten is through networking so I would uh, strongly kind of um, urge you folks to, as I keep saying, I think I'm a little bit of a broken record here, but you just have to go out there. You're kind of responsible for your own career, and yeah. often, oftentimes just go and ask, I want an informational interview, and you know, I want to learn more about what you do. There are opportunities that come out of it, and I just say like, uh, like being in school, you should just get involved in different things. Like when I was at Atkinson, I worked in the chair's office with Diane Stadniki back there, and I worked in the dean's office, and all of those things open up opportunities for you because you know hey I know somebody in the field that you're interested in let me introduce you to to them and things open up that way so I would say networking is very very important I'm just uh, even for you know somewhat iconoclastic individuals myself um, they're definitely it was, it's important who do we know in law school still continue to be oh I went to law school <coughs> with him um, uh, lawyers are very cloistered. We know who was difficult to work with on another deal, who's, you know, the clearly undiagnosed and unmedicated schizophrenic who's still practicing. You really get worried when you have one of those on the other side of a deal. Um, in law school and in the, the next step after law school, of course, is articling, you know, by all means, See if you can find something in a law firm where you're just, you know, doing photocopying. You'd be surprised how much you can learn from photocopying a court record. Um, some of the um, uh, court reporters offices hire law students uh, as uh, typists and court reporters. Um, you know, I found my summering jobs by, this was before internet, uh, use was quite common, uh, as common, and certainly boy, are there some Luddites among lawyering uh, lawyers. I simply went in my neighborhood and, you know, said, I'm just finished first year law, I've got years of experience as a legal secretary, I will summer for you, right? 
and landed the job at Mitchell Barden and Saluki as a summer person where I, I don't know, did what I knew how to do to some extent, but it was the personal interview. Um, and we've had, you know, uh, little high school students who are interning and you, one of them has turned out to be wonderful. She's now in law school, but she was with us for five years, right? He just, it's definitely important. That one of the guys that uh, uh, I went to law school with, he's pretty well the only guy I'm still friends with, and he and his husband um, refer me tons of stuff and I refer him stuff and it's husband's uh, a planner so you know because I do real estate that's involved definitely who you know my son calls it nepotism <laughs> <laughs> you know it's not I correct him that's when you're actually blood relations but it's it's not like you're pulling strings or anything but you hear about stuff and people know you and it's uh, oh yeah that's a good guy or she's a good girl and you know and that person would be a fit and don't be afraid to work for free every now and then, you know. Um, and definitely, FaceTime is still important. One more, we, you know what we do with a fax? Goes in the garbage. An email goes in the garbage. We get zillions of those. Um, dropping by with a resume, believe it or not, you know, you're only going to see the reception. Depends on the office. Sometimes sole practitioners need students. If you're going to law school, you're going to have a hard time getting an articling job. There's, no matter how good your marks are, don't be afraid to work for a, you know, a sole practitioner for peanuts. You've got to get those articles. So hey, get them done. And you're probably going to learn more working for a, a three-man outfit, or excuse the sexist term, three-person outfit, you know, um, than you would on Bay Street, where you often spend a lot of time photocopying. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, keep your ear to the ground, keep your eyes open, make friends, and do the FaceTime. So I'll repeat it. Um, so for those of you at the back who didn't hear, um, if you are graduating or soon to be graduating, um, how important is it to take a year off just to, before you continue with your education and further studies? Any thoughts? Um, I would advocate that so strongly, uh, I, especially if it involves doing something interesting, um, not, not just getting a job at, at the grocery store or something like that, just to sort of figure things out. But engaging in something different to sort of advance a different part of your skill set. In my case, after my undergraduate degree, I went and taught English in Germany for a year. And that, in fact, ended up making my entire career, assuming I get a career in, in history, it was because I spent a year of that first year in Germany. Um, but I think it gave me a big leg up in the MA program. I mean, I was, I was fluent in another language. You know, it gave me this thing above so many other students that when you're applying for a PhD, you get to add, you know, I can do research in languages that people can't. Um, so it, it, but also I think, at least in, in my field, I think most people would say the same thing. As you're finishing, you know, your final degree and, and looking for a career, you start running out of time to be able to do these things. So I think um, at age 22, it was such a wonderful opportunity to go spend a year abroad or, you know, get a job locally, but in something interesting in a way that when you're 30, it becomes a lot more difficult to do. Um, so I would also, for that reason, I think you'll, you'll appreciate it long term in my own experience anyway. I would just say I would agree. Like, I think there's a pro and a con to that. Like, the pro is, is that I've heard from other people, and as Benjamin was saying, is that people take a year off either to work or do something. They become more focused in terms of what they want to do, and that can help in terms of what you want to pursue afterwards. Um, the other thing that I would just say is that sometimes it's better just to get it done. I find is that, you know, once you start working, yeah. you get other commitments. You might have, a f you, you might want to have a family. You might, you know, you're, you're in a job that you really love. And then it's hard to go back after that because, you know, you have a house, you have a mortgage, you have different things. So I think there's a pro and con to both. But as Benjamin said, I mean, if you do it when you're young, that's great because uh, you're never going to have that opportunity again, I think, to be, to do something that you want to do. Uh, you don't have those responsibilities and everything else like that. And that was something that was encouraged to us when we were finishing, when I was finishing my MPA program. Uh, I started, like, I was doing my program while I was working. Like, I had gotten a job even before I finished. And my professor said, uh, she said to me, she said, you know what, try and negotiate, like, you know, two months before you start working. Take those two months to, you know, do something. You know, go out there, enjoy 
and all that because you'll never get it back. And, and I didn't listen to her, and I look back at that and I regret that, and I wish I had negotiated a little bit more. So I think there's a pro and con to both. We have time, yes, we have, so we have time for, I think we'll, that'll be our final question, and then we'll break into our networking session. So how much does it matter if the A factor, in order to, in, in order to use that criteria in the post grad degree, like if you're older, if you're just finishing undergrad, how much does that, that make sense? In terms of getting, uh, like, being successful as an applicant? getting into the program or successfully getting through uh, the program? Okay. Joseph, you wanted to say? Um, I think that if you've got it, in my mind, because you're putting such an investment in your own ideas within a graduate program, if at that age or whatever age it is, young, old, whatever age you're at, if you've got it um, sort of determined what you're going to be pursuing within the program, I think that uh, takes precedent over age, if that makes any sense. Like when I graduated um, from my B.Ed., I thought to go and do my M.Ed. right away, but I didn't know what I would do it in because I had yet to get experiences and something that was meaningful to me to pursue. So um, in a way, I kind of took a, a break as I worked, but um, I thought of developing um, experiences before I would invest so much time into um, an academic pursuit like that. So I would think if you've got it, it's pretty well sorted out what your focus would be and where you think you're going to start off at least in, the, in your graduate studies, then um, it may be uh, more of a motivating factor than, than age, um, in a way, just as thought. I would agree. I think Diane's a great example of that. I think if you're passionate about what you want to do, it doesn't really matter what age you're, uh, you are. Yeah. And uh, I think it goes to what Joseph was saying, is that you have kind of a plan in place as to what you want to do. And uh, I don't think age is as much of an issue now, at least um, that's the way I look at it. So. Okay, we'll take one more question. Um, how much does a four-year degree versus a three-year degree make a difference um, if you're planning to pursue uh, graduate studies. Hmm. So it doesn't matter if you've got a three-year or a four-year degree if you want to pursue graduate studies. Mm -hmm. well, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, you ever are are three-year degrees still possible in uh, Ontario? Yeah. 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 Okay. They're just not honors. Yeah. Okay. Over 90% right. those are one thing. Honors okay. versus uh, regular bachelor's. Well, in law school, you don't actually need an undergraduate degree at all to get in, um, technically. Just try to get in without one, though. Um, I found that the honors, from practical perspective, having the extra year uh, definitely made a difference for my ability to, to understand just how tough <laughs> law school is. So I found that the, third, the fourth year of my, my um, undergrad uh, was a lot harder work and a, hot, a lot higher level <coughs> than the previous three years. So it definitely was helpful for law school to have the four years. Is it necessary? No. And, you know, uh, I understand that uh, um, uh, you can get into law school with only two years of university, and sometimes, if you're a mature student, no university at all. But I don't think they really like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, as long as you're getting good marks. Anyway, whether it's a... a, a it's not quite the same as grad school. I mean, maybe Ben can comment on grad school. I mean, you know, a law degree is, it's not strictly post-grad at all, but it's some of the same principles apply. But you're still trying to get into a school uh, based on past academics, so. And if, in fact, I don't know about at like U of T in York, but at McGill, the degree you get as a lawyer is in fact an undergraduate degree, right? So that's, um, people come in, but yeah. I only know people at McGill, so I don't know if how that applies in Ontario. Well, you know, in Ontario, there's all the law schools are now calling them Juris Doctors, you know, and which is the dumbest thing I've, you know, <laughs> it's an LLB, right? It's still an undergrad degree, technically. But to try to uh, 
cover that up. UT now calls it the a Juris Doctor. So you're instead of saying I, 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 Diane Mason B A on comma L L B, my letters would be if I was a uh, UT grad, it would be Diane Mason B A on J D Juris Doctor, right? You know, which I'm sorry, I think that's <laughs> silly. <laughs> no. So but, Benjamin, can you speak to uh, MA? Yes, yeah, so if you want an MA in the social sciences and humanities, um, I think you have to have a, a four-year uh, degree. I did my undergraduate in, in uh, British Columbia, and they are a, an honors degree is like a, a sort of more intensive four-year degree, but they're both four years, and in that case, it didn't seem to make a difference for me. But I think the four years is entirely required um, in the humanities. Yeah, and for the MPA program as well, you need a four-year honors degree. For, um, same, same thing. Yeah. yeah. The MED you would need four years as well. Yeah. For the BED though, um, like BED, you did yours concurrently. You would, yeah. Um, I think um, in the past the three year was okay, but um, I don't think that's the case anymore. Yeah. All right. So um, this brings us to the um, end of our formal Q and A portion of the afternoon. Um, so our intention for the uh, this, for the afternoon's session was to provide you with an opportunity to learn from um, our alumni panelists and their educational journeys and get some tips and some insights on what their, um, uh, what the, their programs are like and um, you know, get a sense of would that be something you would want to do. Um, so um, we hope you found it useful and helpful uh, and inspiring. I certainly learned that you can do a P one, one reason to do a PhD is all the traveling that's involved. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that in mind. <laughs> um, so um, please join me in thanking our panels for taking time out of uh, <laughs> If you, any of you have any questions about some of the uh, like career-related career questions that um, were raised here or that you came in with and uh, that may, may not have been addressed or fully addressed through the panel, um, please feel free to come by the Career Center. We're in 202 McLaughlin College.